Good afternoon. I'll try not to yell too much. Um, like Scott said, I'm a college senior pastor at Wayside Chapel, and I'd love to invite you out sometime. We have a young adults group that meets on Sunday mornings at 9.15. The cars are in the back. We have a group of about 150 folks. Um, on a given Sunday, there's probably about 70 there, 75 there. But it's a great group. They have live groups that meet throughout the course of the week. So love for you to come check it out. I'll be there on Sunday morning. And then I'm preaching at Wayside March 8th in the big church. So if you want to check out Wayside March 8th, I'll be preaching. That may mean you stay away. But nonetheless, I'll be preaching March 8th. And it's a privilege to be back here at CMDA. I love this ministry and, and love what y'all get to do here. And I was thinking the other day, I recently spoke at a young Aggie men's retreat. So I was speaking to about 100 young Aggies. And this one guy came up to me afterwards after I talked. And he's a high-achieving guy, probably like a lot of y'all. And he came up to me and says, hey, Michael, I'm struggling with something. I said, what's up? He goes, how can I deal with my pride? What should I do? How can I become more humble? And I told him about, you know, certain, just going before the Lord, just confessing that, hey, I struggle with pride. And confessing that to your accountability, that they can ask you tough questions and enter into that area and, and pray for you in that area. But then I told him, and then he said, well, what about you? How do you stay humble? And I said, well, I have an advantage. I said, I'm married. <laughs> and I have kids. And so my sin is ever before me. I have a wonderful Latina wife. And she is, I grew up across the street from her. I love her to death. But she keeps me humble for sure. So I started telling this guy a story just so he would believe me. I told the story of my first Mother's Day with Victoria after we had a child. We have two kids, and our oldest one's Elijah, our youngest one is Luke. And so we got, we got married, and then we got pregnant pretty early after that. And so we're young in our marriage, and it's Mother's Day, and I wake up, and I decide I'm going to clean the whole house. So I mop, I sweep, I, I vacuum, I do the bathrooms, I mow, I garden, I rearrange the pantry. I mean, it's far before cleaning. That takes like six or seven hours. And then I got my son. I said, hey, baby, I'm going to take Elijah with me. We're going to go on some errands so you can have some alone time, which young mothers rarely get. So I remember driving back home that night after all of that, just thinking to myself, man, you are amazing. <laughs> like, you are wonderful. <laughs> like, you might get nominated for husband and father of the year. And so this is my thought process, and I enter into our front door, and I just can't wait to see the beaming smile. I can't wait for the intense hug and kiss to greet her knight in shining armor. But you know what? I didn't even get a smile. And dumbfounded, I look at Corey, and I say, hey, what's the matter? Don't you know all the things that I did for you? And she says, hey, Michael, I really appreciate you cleaning the house. That was nice. And you doing the laundry, that's cool. She goes, but what I really wanted was to spend time with you. What I really wanted was you. And you see, I learned something that day. For me to truly love my wife, I must love her in a way that she receives it. I must love her in a way she receives it. Otherwise, it's really a self-serving, self-seeking love and that's not any love at all. I never stopped and asked my wife, what do you want? What's important to you? I did what I wanted to do. I like a clean house, so I cleaned the house. I needed to go on errands, so I went on errands, and then I came home as if I had made some huge sacrifice for her. I had forgotten to do the most important thing, which was ask her what she wanted. In our thing, many of us here do the exact same thing when it comes to our relationship with God. How many of us go before the Lord and say, God, how do you want me to love you? How should I love you, God? Because here's the bottom line. When you truly love someone, you will seek to love them in ways that makes them feel loved. You will learn to speak their love language because they matter to you. Fortunately for us, God's love language is not a mystery. He has told us what it is. It's in His Word. 
And his love language is worship. It's worship. And so I want to take a few minutes this morning, and I want to look at a passage you may have never read, and a book you might have never heard of. But it's a passage that speaks directly to this, what authentic, true worship of the living God looks like. And so we are going to look in the book of Micah. Now, if you don't know where Micah is, Micah is located in the Old Testament. And he's what theologians call one of the minor prophets. And Micah is living in a time where it's a dark period of history for the nation of Israel. How many of y'all heard of King David? Most about everybody who's been to church. David has a son of Solomon. The kingdom's united. After Solomon, the kingdom has a civil war. It splits. And the nation of Israel becomes two different nations. In the north, it's Israel. and the south, it's Judah. And they both have major problems. And Israel actually falls... And Jude is following in their footsteps right behind them. And this is when Micah lives and prophesies. And so he's prophesying to a people that have forgotten how to worship God. Their hearts are far from God. They continually go to the temple and they offer the sacrifices, but their hearts are far from them. It's much like the Pharisees in the time of Jesus. The people of Judah were doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. They were offering the sacrifices. They were going to the temple. But true, authentic worship was not taking place. And so Michael writes to tell these guys, hey guys, I need to let you in on something. God is about to judge you. God is about to judge you, and you better repent. And if you don't repent, the same thing that happened to Israel is going to happen to you. And that's exactly what happened. As Judah fell in 586 B.C. to the Babylonians, they came in. So now understanding this background, I want to take a few minutes and look at the text. So starting in verse 6, verses 6 through 7, here's what Micah writes. It says, with, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With a, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Starting in verse 6 and going through verse 7, Micah does a little role play. And he acts as if he's the one that's being condemned. So he speaks on behalf of the people of Judah. And notice what he does. He basically comes before the Lord and he says, Hey, God, what do you want? What's going to make you happy, God? And then he lists five different things. And he starts out with something pretty normal, like this offering of cat. And then he goes through something preposterous. Preposterous, this idea of offering your firstborn. Notice the tone. Notice the condescension. Notice the disconnect between the heart and the hands. He's mocking God. It's equivalent to a, a wife telling her husband, hey, you don't, you're not loving me. And the husband's saying, hey, didn't I marry you? I said I loved you on the wedding day. What do you want me to do? You want me to take you out on a date? You want me to buy you another ring? You want me to buy you an exotic island? You want me to make you the Prince of Wales? What do you want? That's the type of tone you have here. And then we come to verse 8, and Micah switches roles. And now he speaks once again on behalf of the people of God. And listen to what he says. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah says, hey guys, hey mortals, hey finite creatures sneering at the infinite God who created you. God has told you how to worship Him. God has told you what He wants. God has told you how to love Him. He has told you what authentic worship looks like. You just haven't been listening. You see, the problem is that they, like many of us, forgot that true worship flows from the heart. It comes inside and out. It was never the sacrifice that pleased God. It was the heart behind it. Because God always cares most about your heart. And here's why. I want you to hear me this. Our affections guide our actions. Our affections 
guide our actions. What we do and how we live is ultimately birthed out of who we are. And who we are is determined by who and what we love. Our affections guide our actions. How we live is determined by who we are, and who we are is defined by who and what we love. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I went on vacation to Dallas, and I took my family, my four-year-old, my two-year-old, and we went to a place I never thought I'd go. We went to Legoland. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real, y'all. I hate Legos. I'm sorry for like Legos. I've hated them since I was a kid. Never to Legos. But you know who loves Legos? My four-year-old Elijah. He loves them. So I dropped 50 bones to take my family of four into Legoland. Why? Because I love my sons. I love them. And as long as they love getting together and building stupid rocket ships, <laughs> then that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to build rocket ships with them because I love them. You know, there's a huge misconception that people have about the Christian life. And many people view their Christian life and they ask themselves, what can I do for God? And they define the Christian life by what is it that I can do for God? And that is backwards. Because the Christian life is defined by what God has done for us. It's not what I can do for God. It's what God has done for us. That's what always comes first. That's why salvation is by faith through grace. By grace through faith. Not of works. It's not ourselves. And no man may boast. It is a grace deal. But then we get the opportunity to respond with great love for a God who first showed us great love. And we do that by allowing him to do things in and through us that we could never do on our own power. And the result of a life of worship, the result of a life that's completely surrendered to God, is one that produces justice, is one that produces mercy, and is one that produces humility. So when we look at verse 8, we look at what Micah says, he mentions that God wants us to act justly. Now why would God require his people to act justly. Because God is a holy and just God. That's his number one description of himself. Not just loving. He is holy. Isaiah 6. Holy. 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 Our Lord, our God is righteous. There is no injustice that exists within him. He cannot stand injustice. And so his people made in his image, redeemed by his son, are to act justly. Now, the problem is with that is that there's injustice all around us, isn't there? As a matter of fact, the injustice is absolutely overwhelming. Just off the top of my head, I think about things like sex trafficking. I think about things about the injustice for the unborn with abortion. I think about terrorism. I think about poverty around the world. Injustice is all around, so much so that many of your friends have looked at the world and they said, God cannot exist. There's too much suffering. There's too much injustice. There's no way an omnipotent, uh, an omnipotent God can be in charge of a world so jacked up. When I hear that statement, I'm reminded of a comic strip I read a few years ago. And it's two turtles talking to each other. And the first turtle says, you know... Sometimes I like to ask God why he allows poverty, why he allows famine and injustice when he could do something about it. And the other turtle looks at the first turtle and he says, you know what? I'm afraid God might ask me the exact same question. You know, whether you are a medical student, a dental student, a nursing student, a faculty member, whether you work here, I pray that part of your worship to God, part of the love letter that you are writing to God, is to act justly and to fight injustice in your personal and your professional lives. I even pray that some of you in here would give up the luxuries of the West and would go across the world spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ by using your tremendous education and your tremendous gifting and going and spreading the love of Christ through medical missions through dental missions. 
I think of a young lady who used to sit in the seat you're sitting in, who's a dear friend of mine, Shannon Potter, who sat in those seats and she saw a documentary about five Ethiopian women who, who had a baby so early in that they couldn't handle it and they developed with obstetric fistulas. And because of that, they couldn't control their bladder. And so they would just constantly urinate and smell awful. And she was so moved by the plight of these women because their husbands divorced them and kicked them out. Their communities and their villages shunned them and said, you can't live here anymore. And these women became destitute. And Shannon saw that. She said, that's not OK. That's not OK. And so she graduated from medical school here. And she did her, she did her residency in St. Louis. And she said, I'm going to work in that field. And she's going to be working in the Congo, performing these surgeries so these women can have healing. She gave up the lake house. She gave up the sports car. She raised support. She's currently in France with her husband and her baby learning French so that she can do this ministry in the Congo. I pray that God would touch your hearts like that as well. The second thing God uses Micah to remind his people of is their need to be merciful. Now, why mercy? We know God is just, but our God is forever merciful. He is not just just, he is forever <coughs> merciful. You see, that's the beauty of the cross, that's the beauty of who God is, that's the beauty of the gospel. Because of his just nature, he couldn't ignore sin, but because of his love and his mercy, he could not ignore us. So as Christ came, he did what we could not do, and he took all the sin of the, sin of the world, rendering God just, and at the same time, he came in divine love to take our place, to offer us redemption and a way home. He is the fullness of truth and grace. He is the fullness of mercy. He is the fullness of righteousness. And that is the beauty of the gospel. That's what Romans 3 is all about. And most likely you are here today because you have experienced this love of God. You know what I'm talking about. Or maybe you're just here for free food. But nonetheless, you're here. And my guess is that you know what I'm talking about. You know that God loves you. You know that God forgives you. But let me ask you a question. Are you practicing forgiveness with those around you? Are you merciful to those in your sphere of influence? And not just merciful to those who deserve it, but merciful to those who don't deserve it. To those who are unmerciful themselves. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 6 where he talks about loving our enemies. And he starts off, he says, if, if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? Even the sinners do that. And he goes on, he gets done at the end of the passage, and he says, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. That's what he said to the disciples. How can we who have been forgiven so much neglect to offer forgiveness to those who have wounded us? How can we, who have been people who've received, who have been the objects of God's mercy, then keep that mercy from those around us? You as physicians and dentists and nurses, please never lose your compassion for people. They're not just appointments. They're people. Never forget that when you serve people, that when you show mercy to your patients, you are worshiping God. Because you are speaking to him in his love language. And that is powerful. I experienced this a few weeks ago with my wife and I's OB-GYN. I guess this is more my wife's OB-GYN. <laughs> <laughs> I have two sons, Elijah and Luke, like I've said. And we found out a couple months ago we were pregnant. We were thrilled. I mean, getting pregnant. Just, when you find out you're pregnant, it's just euphoric. I mean, it's just an amazing deal. We were super excited. And, Planning what we were going to do and getting things together. And uh, a month later, six weeks later or so, my wife started believing and, and continues to believe. And right there in our bathroom, bleeds out our baby. And so we go to the OB gen just to make sure everything's okay. And we go to our doctor and they do an ultrasound and they're like, you know, you're not pregnant anymore. So we suffered a miscarriage. And you know, guys, miscarriages happen, I think, one out of every six pregnancies or something. But it was our first. We had never 
gone through something like that. And our OB Jen, who's been practicing probably 30 years or so, he didn't come in there and go, hey, tell you what, it happens one out of six. You better look next time. You know, just move on. You go yell and help. You get pregnant. That's not what he did. This guy was probably seen hundreds, if not thousands, of miscarriages sat there with my wife. I am sorry this has happened. I know this is tough. My heart breaks for you guys. That's the type of mercy that God desires. And my wife and I experienced that. Your patients are people, and each one of them will have a story. Many will not deserve mercy. Many will be jerks, ungrateful, demanding, cynical, mean, dumb, all of the above. But remember, you and I did not deserve mercy, and yet God gave it to us in fullness through His Son, Jesus Christ. So who are we to withhold that from those who we deem unworthy? So act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Number three, walk humbly. The great St. Augustine, one of my heroes, he once wrote, Humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. In the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other except in appearance except in appearance. Scripture tells us multiple times that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So when I think about why we are to be people of humility, for starters, I think about the fact that God opposes the proud. <laughs> I don't want to get on the wrong side of God. I don't want to be opposed by God. And if that's not, not enough, maybe we should walk humbly because He is infinite and we are finite. Because we are his creation and he is our creator. Because he is the potter and we are the clay. Have you ever thought about how ludicrous it really is to be prideful before God? How insane it is to hold up to him? Look at my class rank. Look at my class rank, God. Hey, look at my residency match, God. What do you think? You're pretty impressed, aren't you? Do you think how crazy that is? God's like, yeah, I can figure it a little bit. Good job. <laughs> Congratulations. You got yourself in the back. It was St. Augustine who also wrote, he said, it was pride that turned angels into demons. And it is humility that makes men as angels. It was pride that turned angels into demons. And it's humility that makes men as angels. True humility does not come by thinking lowly of yourself, but by thinking consistently and accurately about God. Because when I understand that I have nothing to offer God, and yet He still created me. When I understand that I have no way of paying God back, and yet He still redeemed me. And that though I am prone to failure, and yet God still loves me. Then I become humble enough for God to truly use me. Then I'm broken enough for God really to use me. That's what godly humility does. It frees me to stop performing for the applause of man. Because I don't worry about it. I don't worry about getting up in front of people and preaching the gospel. Because I, it's not my problem. It's not my problem whether you like me or not. I would like you to like me. But I want to preach the gospel. Period. And I want to do it for God. Preach for God. And when you give away the need to impress people and to earn favor with people, to make people think you're just this amazing person, and you just go before the Lord and you say, in all humility, use me, he can radically use you in a way that you never thought possible. That is what God the humility can do. Well, I'm closing the, like I said, the book of Micah, which you should read sometime was written about 2,700 years ago. But a lot of the truths of what he said are still applicable today. We may not go to a temple and offer sacrifices, but we certainly are prone to offering up empty praise. We certainly are still prone to do that. And the bottom line is that God does not want empty sacrifices. 
He wants followers who act justly. God doesn't want hollow words. He wants people of incredible mercy. And God is not interested in whitewashed tombs of Christians that look good. He's interested in people who will walk humbly with their God. It was as true then as it is now. I don't know where you ultimately will go, and I don't know what you're ultimately going to do with your life, but I do know what God wants you to be. He wants you to be a person who acts justly because God is just. He wants you to be a person who loves mercy because, friends, our God is forever merciful. And he wants you to be a person who walks humbly with him, knowing that every gift is from him and every gift is for him, now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much just for this time. I thank you for these folks here who are taking up part of their day to come in here and just be together and hear from your word. God, I just pray for the spirit as they walk through really what's a difficult time. The great challenges academically, great challenges spiritually, great challenges emotionally, great challenges physically. How do I prioritize you when I have all this homework? How do I prioritize you when I have a test coming up? How do I prioritize you when I'm competing against one another? How do I prioritize you when all the other students are telling me I'm crazy and I'm nuts and let's just go do this and let's go do that and your God is stupid? How can you be intelligent and believe that? And all the noise that surrounds these folks here, God, I pray that you would just create a community, a cocoon in this community that would minister to one another, that would come before the true God, the true King, and say, yes, Lord, we are yours. And that what exists, the love that would exist in the community of fellowship on this campus would be so intoxicating and so attractive to people around that they would be drawn in and say, what in the world is going on with y'all? God, I pray each person in here, myself included, we come before you and say, God, we don't want to offer up empty praise of cookie-cutter Christian things. We want to be people who follow hard after you and love, knowing that you first loved us and saved us irregardless of what we had done. Now, we would be people that would love you and honor you and follow you and represent you on this earth as those who act justly, as those who love mercy, and as those who walk humbly with you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.